We're here with our lovely captive audience. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to do a video on the birthday paradox, which is about hash collisions. Right? And part of a nice thing about having an audience is we can actually test this and see if it works. Right? And if it doesn't, we can all go home very disappointed. Um, the birthday paradox is this idea that when you have a number of people in a room, the chances that two of them have the same birthday is actually quite high, like a lot higher than we would think. And that seems totally unrelated to cryptography and hash functions, but actually it's quite relevant, right? When you're designing a hash function, you have to think about attacks that exploit the fact that collisions are more likely than you think. And the collisions where two hashes are the same? A collisions when two hashes are the same. So let's have a look at what happens if you get a collision and then how likely that is. So we've done a few videos before on hash functions. Let's recap briefly what a hash function is and then we'll talk about why they might collide and what implications that might have. So you have a huge message that could be any length like this and your hash function here, your hash of the message, this is going to be a fixed length. So let's say 128 bits or 256 bits. So 1, 2, 8 bits or 256 bits, right? And, and, and these days we might use 256 bits, we might use something like 512 bits, right? So that means 512 zeros and ones. And a hash function is designed to, in some sense, summarize this message, but in a random looking way. So these zeros and ones will look completely random, but actually have just been computed from this message. If you put the same message in, you get the same hash back. And that's very useful. So a couple of examples, maybe you want to store passwords. You take your password, you compute the hash of that password, and then you can store that on your disk. And then when someone tries to log in, you just compare that hash. And the idea is that if you're an admin or you're someone who's got access to that server, it's very difficult to look at that hash, which is just a number of zeros and ones, and work out what the original password was. Another good example is maybe you want to perform a digital signature. So you have a document that you're trying to sign or a, or a, a part of a handshake during, let's say, a TLS connection on the web. You might send a message that's been signed, and that signature is often computed on a hash because often the message is just too long for you to be able to sign it reasonably. So you would take this hash and then you would sign that hash. So you might have you know, a digital certificate or something like this, which has got something on it and it's got a public key for a company. And you also have a signature at the bottom and that signature is actually a signed hash of this document. Right? And that allows you to summarize the document and then verify that you were the one that signed it. And the nice thing is because the hash is determined from this message, if you try and change this certificate, the hash suddenly becomes invalid. So it's really useful as a kind of cryptographic checksum to make sure that things haven't been changed. So now let's think about what a hash collision is. We are taking a message that could be any length. So it could be one bit or it could be a billion bits. It doesn't matter how long it is. And we're producing a single hash of, let's say, 256 bits long. Right? So there are two to the 256 possible different hashes, right? Zero, 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 all the way up to one, 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 one. And your message has to come out somewhere in that, that set of messages. This is a very, very big number, not dissimilar actually to the number of atoms in the universe. And so actually getting a hash collision is gonna be very, very unlikely, you'd think. Right? The, the problem is there are actually, despite how big that is, there are actually quite a lot of possible messages. There's actually more messages than there are potential hashes. So by definition, there are many, many messages that hash to the same thing. It's just that because this is a kind of random process, we don't know what that, that process is. We can't predict it. Right? So this comes down to something called the pigeonhole principle. Right? So I'm, I'm probably not going to draw any pigeons because we've, we've been down that road and we know it doesn't go well. But the idea is that you've got, you've got sort of, let's say, some number of, of holes. Right? Okay, I'm just going to do 16. So this is like 2 to the not, not 256. And we put a pigeon in one. And I, I'm going to draw a circle, actually, instead of a pigeon. No, I, I think you need to do an approximation of a pigeon. It has to have wings. Oh, that's sweetie pie, beautiful. It's, oh, it's not great, is it? All right, I put a pigeon in a hole. Now, I've got some spare holes, so I'm going to put one over here. And now, you see, now you've forced me to draw a load of pigeons, so, I, so I'm not happy about this. Yeah, I don't know quite what kind of bird that is. All right, we'll keep going. Now, we are going to get to a point where every single one of these is full. Right? And the point will be exactly when we put in 16 pigeons. Right? This is assuming they all go in different drawers right? or different holes. They might, of course, accidentally happen to go in the same one. But let's suppose we're doing it on purpose. So, you know, uh, here, 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 here. I'll put the legs in later. Uh, oh, I missed one. All right. 16 pigeon ant hybrids. We've got our poor 17th pigeon over here. 
and there, it's got nowhere to go, right? So it has to go in one of these holes, right? And so the pigeonhole principle, and this applies to hash functions and draws, indirect let's draw principle, right? Depend, it doesn't matter how you define it. Once you have more items than there are places to put those items, you will have a collision. Right? Now, in this case of hash functions, we've got two to the power of 256 possible draws, but we have a lot more than that of pigeons, right? Or messages in this case. And so at some point we will get a collision. And the question is, when will that happen? Right? And the birthday paradox is a commonly used example of something that is unintuitively likely, and it actually applies directly to this. Right? So the idea in the birthday paradox is if you have a number of people in a room, the chances that they share a birthday is much bigger than you think. How likely would you think it would be that someone in a room shares a birthday. It's 365 days. Yeah, so you would, you would think it's something related to that. Yeah, you would think... 36 yeah. people, perhaps there's a one in 10 chance or something. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. The, the thing is that you're not comparing one person against all the people. So if you were trying to find out how many people you would need to match my exact birthday, that would be the number of people divided by 365, right? But we're not we're also comparing them with each other as well. So we're not- they don't care what the birthday is. We're not talking about a collision specifically with, with my birthday or with a specific hash. We're talking about any collision against any pair of hashes. So you can imagine if we draw these again, if these are, let's say, birthdays, and someone has this birthday, and someone has this birthday, and someone has this birthday, there's now actually a, a much more likely chance that the next person is gonna hit one of these positions because some of them have been taken up already, right? And you can imagine that as you get a bit more full, now it's about 50-50, and we've not actually added that many in. So if you had, say, 40 or 50 people in a room, then it, we're gonna probably get quite... We're, we're, the, the chance will be somewhere around 70 or 80%, right? Actually, with 40 people, I think it's 90%, okay. right? So actually, the graph is, is, is sort of like this, and I'm gonna kind of mess my graph up a little bit. But if you've got number of people down here, so this is zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, I've, I've not left myself enough room, 60, right? So, yeah, close enough. If we got, uh, it's about 0 0.1 when you get to 10, right? And when you get to 23, it's 50%, right, 0 0.5. And so that goes sort of like that. I've gone too, I've gone too, never mind. And then by the time you get to 40, it's about 90%, and it kind of goes up very, very quickly. And so I thought, while we have all these people in the room, we could try this. We've got, I don't know, about 40 people in the room. There's a pretty good chance they share a birthday. And so let's give it a go. So what we did was we created a Google Sheet where everyone's entering their birthdays. It's not a nice looking sheet, but it will do the job. And basically, if we have two X's in a row, we have a collision. That's the idea. And we do, right? So for example, this person on the 23rd of April is the only person with that birthday, so they're very special. But these poor people on, the, on August the 30th, they have the same birthday. We won't necessarily ask them to out themselves. No, no, no. That was great. We found that two sets of people share birthdays. Why does this matter, right? I mean, that was, that was gonna happen. We have some sort of 40 or so people in the room. It was quite likely, it wasn't guaranteed. The th so with hash functions, it means that if you're just picking hashes at random, you're more likely to get that collision than you think. Right? And so actually, when you have a hash function that's two to the 256 different options, the chance is not you know, one or two over two to the 256, which is a very, very small number. It's actually the square root of that, right? So it's two to the 256 over two, which is about two to the 128. Now, that's actually, as it happens, not that bad, right? That's still a number. That's something like uh, one under cillion or some billion, 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 billion or something like this. Um, we're not gonna be getting that either. But if you had a hash function that was only 128 bits, suddenly your, your collision sp search space is about two to the 64, which is actually fairly practical for people with big servers, of which there are, you know, some nation states and so on, right? So, so let's imagine you have a, um, a hash function which has a small enough output size that you might get a collision. What could you do? Well, let's, let's just give you a contrived example. Let's imagine you're computing a digital signature on, let's say, a housing contract or something like that, right? And let's say I'm gonna buy it for 100,000. It's not a good house. Now, I'm gonna sign this, right? Now, I have, maybe I have a logo in the corner, right? Or some, some sort of image, right? And so I hash this PDF or whatever it is, and I stamp my digital signature on the bottom, right? Now, I also create another one 
Or maybe I give it to you to sign, or something like that. I don't know, I don't know how this works, right? Um, I have another one where I'm buying, and I'm gonna buy it for, let's say, 50,000. So I'm gonna make myself a good saving here, and I'm gonna, it's gonna look otherwise exactly the same. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna twiddle about very, very subtly with the pixels of this image, or some other part of this document that isn't immediately obvious, and I'm gonna produce different hashes of these two documents in bulk. And because it's more likely than we thought, eventually I will have two of these that look almost exactly the same, but actually they have the same hash, even though they have different numbers on. And you'll be very pleased because I've agreed and signed this 100,000 one, but I can swap this one out later. Right? Now, this, this example doesn't really work, but the, the point is, if we can find collisions, we can forge digital signatures, and then you start not being able to trust messages that we send on the internet and things like this. Right? Now, actually, what might happen is you might find a collision with a complete random nonsense document that doesn't help you. Right? So just finding a collision on its own isn't necessarily a complete deal breaker for whatever system you're using, but it's not a good sign. And indeed, that's you know, it's, it's almost like lesson one for, for hash function design. So that's why, you know, hash functions like MD5, which we used for many years, they have their own other weaknesses, but they also just don't have that out long an output length. For SHA-1, was, a collision was found, right, for other mathematical reasons, but actually it only had an output size of 160 bits, which meant the search space is, is, is 2 to the 80, right, to find a collision, which is, is a little bit out of reach unless we, everyone on Earth club together, but it's not completely impossible. And if you add another 10 years or 20 years of progress on, maybe it's doable. Right? So this is the kind of thing you have to think about when you design hash functions. You have to make their output both look really random, but also be long enough that you can't start doing lots and lots of brute force searches for different pairs. Right? Um, and so all of the hash functions we use now will be usually at least 256 bits, right? and often are quite a lot longer than that. But practically, though, because you've talked about these massive numbers and huge, huge amounts of, you know, mm -hmm. s large spaces and things, what can we do about it? You know, how can we prevent it or avoid it? You, you can't prevent it. That's the, the wonderful thing about hash functions. There are more messages than there are hashes. You will get a collision. It's just very unlikely. And so you, we play the numbers, right? There, there could be a collision between two files on Earth that have just never been compared before, but we don't know and we don't worry about it too much because the, the chances are so vanishingly small that we can just move, go about our business. Right? And so, um, in actual fact, this is an interesting story because when, when Google produced two PDFs that had the same SHA-1 hash, that actually caused huge problems on GitHub because GitHub was using SHA-1 to do versioning, basically. And now we had two files with the same hash and it got very confused. Um, and, and so, you know, these files could be over the other side of the world and never interact, but if they get brought together, suddenly your systems that are designed with the idea that these hashes are never the same start to break. So it would be quite interesting, if unlikely. As you may have noticed already, Computerfile is supported by Jane Street. They're a global market trading firm using machine learning, distributed systems, programmable hardware statistics, all that good stuff. In addition to hiring top talent, they also run free programs to give people a little peek into their world. Here are just some of them on screen at the moment, including WISE, which is currently accepting applicants. This one is a two-day program run in New York, London and Hong Kong. They're aimed at self-identifying women, transgender and gender expansive people who are about to start their first year of university. By the way, you don't have to be based in those cities to apply. Many students fly in from around the world. No finance experience necessary, just a curious mind. Learn who Jane Street are, what they do, how they do it. You'll also meet a lot of like-minded people on the program. It's a bunch of fun. There's no cost to participate, travel, accommodation, it's all covered. Applications close in May and June for programs taking place in July and August. Also, keep an eye on the Jane Street website for other programs that might suit you. There will be a link on the screen, more in the description in the comments. Thanks to Jane Street for supporting Computerfile.